Part 4. First Meetings One way of understanding Buddhist practice is to conceive of it as a long series of awakenings, some mundane, easily overlooked and only appreciated in retrospect, others more dramatic and memorable. Meeting Luang Po for the first time was the occasion for many awakenings of both kinds. Some people found the experience electric. For others, it signaled the beginning of gradual but inexorable changes in their values and way of life. Listening to Luang Po teach for the first time, a common perception was that his words seemed to articulate truths far better than they could themselves, that on one level their hearts already sensed, but which they had never been able to make conscious. The emotional effect of such revelations could be profound. Some people abandoned addictions or superstitions, began to keep precepts strictly, started to meditate. A certain number became monks and nuns. But not all were so ripe for radical change. In many cases, people were moved by Luang Po's presence, his charisma, the peace and compassion they sensed in him, but not so much as to take on board too much of the wisdom he shared. What stayed with them was the joy and uplift they'd felt at having been in the presence of such a monk, together with a strengthened faith in the Triple Gem. For these people, the immediate effect on their lives manifested as an increased commitment and pleasure in providing material support to the monastic order. There were also those who went to pay respects to Luang Por and were unmoved by the experience. Occasionally, people departed the monastery feeling disappointed, angry or offended. Although Luang Por could be diplomatic when the situation called for it, he could also choose not to be particularly if he saw fit to puncture a guest's self-importance and conceit. Often, his words or manner would shake the visitor's complacency and allow them to open to the teachings. Occasionally, it did not work at all. The guest would quietly leave, pride bruised, and once safely out of the monastery, fume at how they'd been treated. Although Luang Po's ability to find a way to get through to people was remarkable, he was not infallible. Sometimes people's confusion or attachments erected barriers that were not to be breached. The Buddha once said that if a vessel is overturned, then even the sunlight cannot enter within it. Luang Po himself was fond of the simile of the vessel full to the brim with water, allowing no space for more. Ta Sui Ta Sui was so inspired by his first encounter with Luang Po that it led him to dismantle his simple wooden house and reassemble it on land close to the monastery. I first heard about Luang Po Cha from a monk I knew called Ajahn Tong Chua. One day he told me that there are different types of monks. There are monks who practice well and correctly and those that don't. Monks of the second kind are not true fields of merit. If you associate with them, you get no benefit. I asked him where I could find a monk of the first sort, and he said there was such a monk at Wat Ba Pong. Ajahn Tong Chia took me along the first time. We arrived at about three o'clock in the afternoon and spoke with Long Po until almost seven in the evening. I completely forgot to get hungry. There were a lot of mosquitoes, but I didn't notice them. After the conversation was over, Luang Po gave a Dhamma talk that lasted until midnight. Then he told me to go and have a rest. But there was nowhere to lie down. The Dhamma hall hadn't been built yet. And so I sat and listened to Luang Po talk on through to dawn. Before Luang Po left on arms round, he told me to pick some edible leaves because the monks wouldn't have much to eat with their rice. He was right. When the monks returned, all they had, apart from rice, were chilies and fermented fish. So I pounded all that together, roasted the mixture in a pan and made a sauce. There were about six monks altogether and the same number of mere cheese. 
the chilli sauce, was distributed evenly and we ate it with the rice and raw and boiled leaves. I stayed with Lung Po in the monastery for two days and then went home. I made a determination to go again. I don't know how he was able to explain the Dhamma in such a way that I could understand it so clearly. From that day onwards, I gave up drinking alcohol and fishing and taking the life of even the smallest creatures. Po Nupi In an early Wat Ba Pong publication, a legendary dialogue is recreated. Written with a certain amount of poetic license and apparently modelled upon dialogues between the Buddha and sceptical Brahmins found in the suttas, it relates how Po Nupi, one of Luang Po's biggest critics, was tamed and converted into a loyal lay disciple. Po Nupi was well read, unusually so at the time, and known locally for his knowledge and acumen. He took pride in himself as a free thinker, and in the village was generally considered a little too fond of his own views and opinions. On occasions, he would go with family and friends to listen to Luang Po's weekly Dhamma talk, but afterwards would always be critical of it to his friends. One day, on a visit to the Wat, Luang Po invited him to speak frankly about his criticisms and not worry about offending him. He wanted to know exactly what Po Nu Pi's objections were. Much later, Po Nu Pi was to admit that when Luang Po reassured him that he would not get angry whatever was said, he sensed an opportunity for which he had been waiting for a long time. If, he reasoned, he spoke strongly and Luang Po listened quietly, he would enjoy getting things off his chest. If Luang Po showed signs of anger, he would admonish him, What kind of a meditation monk are you? You can't even endure a few harsh words. And so he jumped straight in, accusing Luang Po of being deluded. All religions are conventions, he declared. Their teachings are stories for children, made up to control people. Merit and demerit don't exist. Luang Po had fallen for this idea of gamma so completely that out of fear of creating bad gamma, he was hiding away in the forest and tormenting his body for nothing rather than living in the real world. If he wanted to be a monk, then why not live in the monastery in the village instead of in the middle of a forest? Better still, he should disrobe and enjoy life. Luang Po sat through the whole tirade in silence and then quietly repeated the Buddha's analogy of people cut off from the truth of things, being like lotuses submerged beneath the mud. He asked a question. If Ponupi did not believe in bad gamma, why didn't he take up armed robbery, or perhaps kill someone to see what that was like? Ponupi snorted that he wasn't stupid. If he killed someone, their family would hunt him down, or he'd be thrown into prison. Luang Po commented that that was why it was called bad gamma. On being challenged how he knew that all the effort he was putting into leading a virtuous life in the forest had any point to it, Luang Po chose to reply in terms his questioner might easily understand. Echoing the Galama Sutta, he said that given the stakes, torment in a hell realm for a very long time, awaiting a wrongdoer if the law of gamma was true, Assuming the law of Kamma to be true was more intelligent than assuming it was not. Nothing significant was lost, and much stood to be gained. Luang Po's practical, down-to-earth answers gradually began to dissolve Po Nupi's bluster. He finally admitted that he wasn't really so sure about this matter of Kamma. In fact, he'd spent so much time thinking about it that he felt his head was going to split open. When he asked for some guidance, Luang Po said, The important thing to understand is that you have to sincerely abandon the bad and cultivate the good before you can know if merit and demerit really exist. When Po Nu Pi asked Luang Po how he might do that, he was told that with such serious wrong views, it wouldn't be good to give him any teaching yet as he would only distort it. 
Ponupi had one more cutting rejoinder. Isn't the Buddha supposed to have more excellent knowledge and wisdom than anyone else in this world? He is the most sublime teacher, and you're his disciple. I'm the disciple of Mara. If you can't teach me, then you've got less wisdom than Mara. Lung Po, presumably smiling at these words, replied, If you're sincere about listening to the Dhamma, then pay attention, and I'll give you a teaching to take away and reflect on and put to the test. Whether you believe it or not, try it out. You don't believe in teachings that you've heard from other monks, is that right? Yes, that's right. I don't believe anybody but myself. Well, if you don't believe others, then you shouldn't believe yourself either. You're a carpenter. Have you never made a mistake sawing wood? Yes, I have. Other matters are the same. Have you only ever thought and acted correctly? Have you never got things wrong? Never acted incorrectly? I've made mistakes. Well, if that's the case, if your mind is capable of leading you to think wrongly, speak wrongly and act wrongly, you can't believe it either. Then what should I do? Don't think so much. And don't talk so much either. The text does not elaborate if any further teachings followed these words. It does relate, however, that over the following days, Ponupi couldn't put Luang Po's words out of his mind. He couldn't help himself, and the more he reflected on Luang Po's words, the truer they seemed, and the truer seemed the teachings of the Buddha. He could no longer find any arguments against them. Ponupi's conceit and pride started to wane. He abandoned his stubborn character and offered himself as a disciple of Luang Po. He kept the five precepts strictly, started to meditate, and became a pillar of the monastery lay support. Matthew It might be argued that many people came into Luang Po's presence for the first time with such a sense of awe and reverence that they were fully primed to be emotionally affected by the experience, whatever Luang Po said and did. But there were also cases where people were quite unprepared for the strength of the feelings that he evoked in them. Matthew was a local woman, a scientist with a master's degree in biology from an American university. Meeting Luang Po was a pivotal moment in her life and the first step to her abandoning the world in favor of monastic training. When the three of us arrived at his kuti, Lung Po already had guests. There was a monk there with his group of lay supporters from Bangkok paying their respects. The area underneath Lung Po's kuti was packed and so we looked for a place to sit down on the outer edge of the concrete floor. Then something really strange happened. As soon as I began to bow, I felt as if I was being bathed in a stream of coolness emanating from Lung Po. I felt instantly refreshed right through my body and mind. It was like coming out of a hot, muggy place and into an air-conditioned room. I stared at Luang Po and my thought at that moment was, so this is what they mean by metta. After a few moments, the group from Bangkok took their leave. Luang Po picked up a pile of small black and white photographs of himself and distributed them. He told his visitors that since they had taken the trouble to come such a long way to see him, and although he had no real gift to give them in return other than the words of Dhamma, he did have these photos that a lay supporter had offered him if anyone wanted one. Of course, everyone did. As soon as I saw Luang Po giving out photographs, desire immediately reared its head. I was worried that there would be none left. And so I spoke up from the back of the crowd, Lung Po, I'd like one as well. Lung Po glanced over at me as he distributed the pictures just for a split second, but it made my heart drop down to my feet. I realized that I'd done something inappropriate, exposing my greed in such a coarse way. 
when all the Bangkok people had left, Luang Po called out gruffly, Where is she? The one who wanted the picture so much, where is she? He caught sight of me. Come and get one then. I crawled towards him, even though I found myself shaking with fear. I forced myself to glance up at his face. At the moment that I put out my hand to receive the photo, I saw that his complexion was incredibly warm and radiant. It was a face full of a genuine kindness and compassion for sentient beings. It showed no trace of the annoyance or irritation that I'd expected to see. My fear dissolved. From that moment, until the time that we bowed and took our leave, my ears were ringing. I can't remember anything that Lung Po said to us. All I can remember is how blissful I felt. Po Bua Pa In Thailand, monasteries have always been the place that people can go to seek respite when their life goes wrong. Many people go to monasteries with a superstitious belief that a particular ceremony or offering to the Sangha will offset their bad fortune. But many who went to see Luang Po desired advice and wise reflections. He once joked, Living here is like living in a garage. Anyone who has something wrong with them, or with their children, or with their wife, or husband, comes to give it to me to sort out. Just like someone whose car has broken down pushes it into the garage and gives it to the mechanic. The Buddha called separation from a loved one a messenger of Dhamma. In other words, the suffering caused by such separation wakes people up to the truths of life that they have formerly been able to ignore but can do so no longer. One of Luang Po's most devoted lay disciples, Po Buapa, first made his way to Wat Bapong during a period of inconsolable grief. When I got back from the war, I married a girl from Na Sum. We had a couple of kids and we were happy. Then the younger one died. My wife and I were overwhelmed with grief. I missed that child so much, I couldn't eat or sleep. It was sad, but life went on. Now though, I felt as if I was just drifting along aimlessly. I couldn't shake off my depression. At that time, Luang Po had been at Wat Ba Pong for two or three years. A neighbor of mine saw how much I was suffering and suggested that I go to see him. He said he might be able to help me get over it, and I went to pay respects to Luang Po and told him my story. He told me that everyone in the world has to die sooner or later. There isn't a single village, a single house, where there's never been a death. Even in monasteries, monks and novices die. Luang Po told Po Buapa that he too must die, and perhaps in no long time. Given that his time in the world was limited, endlessly grieving and lamenting for the departed was helpful to none. Wise people think of the uncertain time remaining to them and find renewed meaning in their life through devotion to goodness and virtue. It's probable that Po Buapa had heard similar words from well-wishers many times before and been untouched by them. But somehow, when they were spoken by Luang Po, it seemed to him that he heard them for the first time, and the truth of them struck him forcibly. He said that me and my wife should work together to do whatever was of true benefit to ourselves and others. We should establish ourselves in right livelihood and steadily cultivate goodness and virtue as a supporting condition and provision for the future. As I listened to Luang Po's teaching, I found myself agreeing with everything he said. It was the turning point. And it made me enjoy listening to Dhamma. I started to nip off to see him more often. I learned many things, and my faith and respect in him grew and grew. Luang Po gave me jobs to do, helping to clear paths, cutting grass. I felt very proud to be his trusted helper. My happiness returned.
Paw Um. Some people were impressed by Luang Po's teachings, but were too proud and stubborn to accept them without a fight. One such man was the herbalist Po Um, who argued with Luang Po until he lost consciousness. Before I came to revere Luang Po, I argued with him for four days and nights. During the days, I was helping him plant a row of bamboo around the perimeter of the monastery. Night times, I'd carry on disputing with him right through to dawn. I'd say something like, "If the rice is my rice and the flour is my flour, how can it be bad gumma to make it into booze?" And he'd reply, "You've got a knife. You can use the sharp side to kill and destroy, or you can use it to prepare food. The knife is your knife." But if you bring the spine down on top of your head, how does it feel? So anyway, we argued for four days and nights. On the fourth day at noon, I felt dizzy and I fainted. Luang Po came to see what was wrong. I said, "I don't know. Everything's gone dark. I can't see anything." Luang Po took me by the hand and led me to the mango grove. Then he rang the bell. There were about six monks in the monastery at that time. He told them to bring a mat and pillow for me to lie on. Then he told them to put four water jars to the north of me and two to the south, and fill them up to the brim. I don't know how long I lay there before I regained consciousness. When I tried to retrace my movements. The last thing I could remember was that I'd been at the Dhamma Hall. So what was I doing in the mango grove? I turned to the west, all confused, and then looked about me. At that moment, I heard Luang Po's voice calling me from behind my head, "Po Am, Po Am." I twisted my head back and saw him sitting cross-legged on a bamboo platform, watching over me. He said, "That's what happens when you contend with a monk teaching the Dhamma. You argued all night. You argued all day, four days and four nights. It's not possible to defeat the Dhamma, you know, and that's why you fainted." I was starting to feel better. Water vapor is a folk remedy for reviving people when they fainted, and it was making me feel cool, comfortable, and refreshed. When I look back now on what happened, I see that I had it all wrong. Luang Po said that someone who lives in a high place is capable of seeing a person who is below him, but someone who lives in a low place can't see someone who is higher. I reflected on that. He was right.